with a decent pinhole, and it might be something. You know what? There's an upgrade. We could do an upgrade for the pin. Um, ring light. This is one that is still kind of in fashion. Um, the ring light is basically a strobe. Again, I didn't shoot this. I found this on Google when you Google ring light. Um, it's basically a strobe that goes around the lens. This you'll see in a lot of editorial photographers use this. A lot of magazines. Um, Time Magazine even ran about two months ago. I can't remember who was on the cover, but a, uh, a ring light. And one thing that is, it gives you a real funky, you don't really have it on this one, um, but it's, it's light that comes from every angle. And when they're against a regular background, this looks like it was knocked out and put on the, the other one. I've got another example. You get this weird... Um, shadow that goes completely around the, the person. That's one of the telling things. And that is still kind of in vogue. I want to say two years ago, it was huge. Where you very, and a lot of editorial photographers would use it because they would literally, instead of having to go in and set up a bunch of bags, you literally have this ring light on your camera. You can walk in, and editorial photography does not pay a whole lot. Magazine photography, as glamorous as it sounds, you know, inside Time magazines, still 300 bucks. So they're not going to spend all day lighting something for, for a couple hundred bucks. They're going with the ring light mounted the camera, and you can get something kind of a little bit different, a little bit unusual. Um, but again, you start seeing these, these visual um, these looks, and they, um, you know, and once you, you kind of recognize them, you'll start seeing when they're used. A lot of business magazines, um, this is out of Barron's, I think. It was a stock shot. Here's the usage of it. Um, this is a uh, ring light just used as a fill. You can tell the main light is kind of laying this big shadow here, but it still gives you that real funky, round, kind of ghosty image. That to me, I don't feel as timeless. It, it looks, it still looks gimmicky. Um, these are some of the flash tubes that uh, a ring light um, will utilize. And it basically goes on, it looks like a cake pan on the front of a camera that has a, uh, that the camera you, you put the lens through. There are some that are made now that a lot of students are using that literally just take the top, um, your, your hot shoe flash, and they light pipe it down around the lens. So a normal ring light like this is about two grand. Um, for about two, three hundred bucks, companies are making, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it, Ray something. They're making ones that are that will use your little hot shoe flash to to kind of emulate that look. Uh, this is a continuous light source one for a motion picture camera made out of LEDs. But we're stuck. Do I need the use pen? There we go. Tilt shift. You know what? I've got. I brought a tilt shift with me. Uh, this is one that is still very, very popular um, that we're seeing a lot of. Basically, it is a little miniature view camera. You didn't have a view camera with you. You just had the... No, I, no, I okay. don't know. Basically, you mount this to a camera, and the lens can go rise and fall, and it can do a tilt. Now, normally, this lens was designed... There we go. So you can turn that, and it just rotates the lens on its axis. Now, normally, this is designed to either control the plane of focus, so I can, if I just want to get U4 in focus, I could throw a little tilt on there, change the plane of focus here so you guys are for in focus, or for architectural use, to be able to rise up, I can come up and get the chandelier in the photograph and not get the edges to tilt. That's what it was designed for. But, and that's out of the case, so you can read that up. What people are doing with it is when you use it on subjects, like some of these, this is uh, Joe McNally's stuff, you can make stuff look like miniatures because of the way you can throw the plane of focus out. And so you'll see this is very popular. This is being used quite a bit. Um, again, editorially, a lot of um, even books I've noticed using um, a lot of websites using images shot with a tilt shift camera. It gives you a real funky. Um, this is again Joe McNally. He, yes, there's a ton of them. Yeah. Um, what's the one that we, we show a couple of them in class that are. Um, the sandbox, I think, is one of them in New York, and they're they're combining, they're using um, like telescope mounts, and they're doing time lapse with tilt shift. So they're starting to combine stuff. So where a telescope mount would normally track, you'd go set up on whatever it is you're going to look at, and it it turns the telescope to track to to offset the the rotation of the Earth. What they're doing is they're taking the 
telescope off, mounting a camera on it, and over a six hour period, they'll get the camera to spin like that. And so you can time that for sunrise or sunset or rush hour and combine it with a tilt shift lens and you get these real funky effects. Joe McNally calls this, oh, what did he, I saw him present stuff. I want to say he calls it like rush hour in the Hamptons. This is everyone in New York trying to get out on Friday night. Totally looks like a miniature. Looks like I'm looking at someone's train set. But again, I feel like it's gimmicky. It's not, you know, we saw those images this morning that are classic. They're timeless. You shot them two months ago, and they look gorgeous. They look just like they're going to look in, in the 20 years ago, and in 20 years they're going to hold up. You're not going to look at them and say, oh, looks like a tilt shift. Remember when everyone was using plastic cameras? Um, you know, my son won't believe me that that's not a miniature. Phenomenal. Very graphic. Um, kind of interesting effect. How exactly does it make, I know what you just described, but how does it make it look like? I've got a camera body. We can play with it afterwards. Okay. I'll be more than happy to show. So that lens that we're passing around is about $2,300. Um, so a lot of people said, oh, well, that's great, but I can't afford that. So this company, Lens Baby, came out with something that looks like that. Here's one here I'm going to pass around. It's basically a single element lens on a piece of drain pipe. Um, brilliant company. This thing probably costs, you guys could probably estimate what it costs to make one of these. I'm going to say five bucks, eight bucks. I'll start it over here. Six ninety nine. Six ninety nine. Guess how much it's going for? 179 bucks. Um, and you are hard pressed to go see a wedding photographer, high school senior, um, a lot of on, um, direct client users using the heck out of these. I do a class in the summer called Modern Alternative Practices where we literally start with holgas, pinholes, and we start at the very core of optics, of photography, so that students understand what it is that, that they're not, you know, tilt shift is not an app for your phone. It's a process that started with four by five cameras. But if they don't understand where it came from, they're gonna have a hard time leaping forward. They're gonna when the next app comes out, that's all they're gonna know. They're not gonna know what it's really emulating. Another um, lens baby. These are stolen right from the Lens Baby website. Wedding, lots of weddings. A friend of mine got married, and she was very annoyed because she never, and the pictures looked great, and she liked them. And then a year later, she came back. She was actually a high school teacher who shot, who um, her master's in Photoshop, so she taught Photoshop for me in the summer. And um, after she had, after her pictures had really resonated, and the wedding had kind of gone away. She was frustrated. She never had a picture of her and her husband on their wedding day, both of them tax sharp. That everything was shot lens baby. And the photographer makes a ton of money, goes out with two, you know, him and a second shooter, and their main shtick is either the 50 millimeter 1-2 Canon wide open or the lens baby. And that's what they're going for, that real selective focus. So, again, lacking in kind of the timeless quality that I feel like the pinhole delivers. Um, I got involved with pinhole... God. Well, really, um, my very first memory with my dad photographically is in the front yard. We built a, for a science fair, a pinhole camera out of a tub of oats. And you go in the dark room, you take the lid out of a uh, tub of oats, Quaker oats. And yeah, and you make the pin on one side, you cut it out, put a piece of aluminum foil, literally pop it with a pin, and then you go in the dark room, put a piece of paper in, it goes backwards, and you go outside, and you pull it out. I don't even think we put tape on it. We just covered it up, ran outside, shot a picture of the front of the house, developed it, had a reverse. It was and, – and like that started the gears turning. Um, I shot a ton when Type 55 Polaroid was still available and affordable. Um, Type 55 Polaroid was a certain Polaroid that let you um, go out, shoot in the field. You'd pop it. Um, it was just like a Polaroid camera, you, or a Polaroid back, but you can get an image right away. And then also, you would put it in, expose it, and then you could like kind of mark that, take it home, and then recover the negative. This shot is a Type 55. I would go down, make sure your exposures are good, and then you'd shoot a couple sheets that you would go develop at home, and then you have a certain procedure to get the negatives recovered, and then you had a black and white negative. Um, so I shot a ton of Type 55. Polaroid went out of business. Boxes of Type 55 shot up for like 200 bucks a box. I had three sheets left that I sold for I think 56 bucks to another instructor at school. I felt like I should have been wearing a mask when he paid me for them, but he he bought them. 
Um, and then I bought um, DSLRs came out and everyone forgot about everything we already knew and we thought this is great. I can just turn around and see what I'm doing on the back of the camera. And then everyone went out and bought a D100 when it came out and then the D200 came out and the Canon came out and then the 5D. And now, you know, everyone's using the same camera, the same lens. They were going out and we're, we're throwing post-production solutions. We'll come back, we'll get our images, we'll put, you know, we buy a bunch of Photoshop plugins or we'll go in Lightroom and we do the same stuff. And I feel like photography is losing a lot of its uniqueness and its genuineness because we're going out and it's, it's all the same. So one thing that Pinhole really does, uh, when the first 35 millimeter DSLR Pinhole came out, I tested it and didn't really like it. It, it just, it felt, um, it just felt like an out of focus, like a mistake. It, it lost some of the, the charm that I think that, that Pinhole really has. So, um, I started, I don't know, about a year ago. Um, Gary, it's been longer. I don't know. He said, hey, try this pinhole lens cap. And we started talking. Um, and recently, I got one of the current versions. And so for the past, I don't know, six weeks, four weeks, I've been shooting like crazy. I carry it with me everywhere I go. The nice thing is, is it's now a lot smaller. It doesn't have a lens sticking out. It's just a camera. So I started carrying this with me. And I've got a ton of prints on this table over here, too. Uh, but these are all pinholes. And one huge advantage where digital is now, where it wasn't five years ago, is you can now crank the ISO up to 1600 and get amazing results. The new Mark III is even better. Um, I'm reluctant to buy it until they figure out there, there's a technical issue with the camera. Um, but I'll eventually get it. So these are all shot with the Canon Mark II. It's a full frame camera. Easily, um, and I'll, I'll, th these two are 1600. There are, um, some of them are up to 4,000, some are up to 6,400. So the camera's maxed out. There's two shots at the end that are, you can put the camera in like high mode. And they don't really tell you what it is, but it's way past 6,400. And the results, while they do have grain or digital noise, it, it, it's coherent with the look of the pinhole. And it also, if you match it with your lighting and your subject quality, it works. So is, it, is this going to replace a you know, $5,000 lens, a $2,300 tilt shift lens. No, but it's another tool. And it's a, when used properly with the right kind of light, you can get amazing results like this. Um, this is just goofing around in the park. I want to say this was exposures range. This was 1,600, about an eighth of a second on overcast day. I took the train into Chicago, so I shoot, I shoot a, a remarkable amount of pictures all the time. Um, these are out the window of the train. I did a couple of these I knocked down to black and white because the trains in Chicago, uh, I think there's a couple shots back there that aren't, um, that aren't filtered. The, the, the glass on the windows is green. So everything comes out very, very green. So this was, um, I desaturated that, which is about the most I'll do. I do a cleanup for the sensor for noise. Um, going out of Sport Mart. I really like the, le the lines in the bottom kind of leading up to the sun. This is un uncorrected out of the train window on an overcast day. Now, Absolutely. Are you, are you, uh, I, I was in the train your hand mm -hmm. When you did the things with the horses, I'm here phenomenal. I, it's handheld. I was panning. Hand yeah, I was okay. panning with them. Um, and I, the, uh, this, I've got this little bag. In Chicago, you can't, um, I'm even a member of this group that, um, it's really a group of a bunch of kids.